Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Therapist Uncensored. I'm Ann Kelly. And I'm Sue Marriott. And we realize that we have done an episode on the different types of insecure attachment protection strategies. But we've never actually talked directly or done a whole one on what is secure attachment. I like to call it secure protective strategies and connective strategies. But what is secure attachment look like? So we decided to dedicate a whole episode to security. Which is great yeah. because it's all bad news, always, constantly. Yeah, we're always talking. <laughs> so this will be, be a feel good episode because this is true that when we talk about security, it primes security. It's true. So let's feel good together. I like it. And as we think about what creates security, it gives us something many of you out there probably came from the kind of background where you have a secure background and you have a secure attachment. And some of us- I don't think that's true. <laughs> Well, more the majority. I think everybody listening to this podcast probably has some color in their history. <laughs> well, that's true, but we can have lots of color in our backgrounds and still have a secure base, right? You can have a secure base with pockets of insecurity, or you could have a background where you kind of live more in your protective red or your more protective blue or tie dye. But let's talk about what security looks like. What is a secure attachment about? So when Anne's mentioning the red and the blue, the way that we talk about attachment is we're bringing it out of the research categories of insecure and secure or anything that's a box because human beings are complex. And even if you fit in that box, it doesn't matter because you're not always there. So if I'm dismissing, I'm not always dismissive. So we like to talk about it on a continuum and we use colors that sort of represent the feel of the defense. So she mentioned red is the upregulated, like more anxious, preoccupied. Means that you've kind of learned that you have to kind of, your nervous system learns it has to stay on alert and it's emotionally aware, kind of emotionally intense. That's where your protective system goes when you hit stress. You hyperactivate on the red side and then on blue, you hypoactivate. Your attachment system turns down. So that's why we it's blue. It's cool. <laughs> so we've done podcasts on both of those. So green, she mentioned, which is the secure. And then tie-dye, she also mentioned, which is the folks that don't fit quite in the, uh, the others. And that's such a complicated conversation around what used to be called disorganized. It's the least understood category. We call it tie-dye. It's a mix of things, a mix of strategies. And we don't live in tie-dye, but sometimes we can get disorganized. And what's important about not living including secure, because we're going to talk about green and secure today. And we call it green because it's kind of a ghost state. It's more of our open state. But these parts of our systems get activated mostly during stress and stress when our attachment system feels at threat. So we don't typically live there. So this is like you might find yourself living in more of a secure place, but when you get activated, you end up leaning red or blue, or you might find that your history has been such that you kind of primarily remain more in one color or the next. So that's what you're meaning when you say we don't just live in one or the other. And different relationships bring out different things. Right. And that's one of the cool things about the spectrum that we talk about is we've got the map on the spectrum, which is where we live, kind of more in concrete patterns. So let's say that I'm, I live, quote, or I rest my nervous system rests more blue, where I'm a little bit more zipped up, a little bit more independent. But when I get upset, it doesn't mean I go blue. I might go more blue, but I also might go red. I might go tie-dye. Hopefully I'm staying in the green. So yeah, there's a lot of flexibility. There's states and traits. So living in something, what we don't really live in it, but like um, our, our more persistent pattern is uh, represented by a map on the spectrum. And then the spectrum itself is the states. And so green as a map or as a state, looks like what? So that's when our early learning and our early experiences have generally led us to believe that our environment is going to be there for us. The people that are caretaking us are going to be there. They're trustworthy. We can kind of rely on them. They're there enough for us to feel safe, but not so much that we don't develop our own sense of our own self, our own being, our own agency over time. So a secure way of relating, a secure way of attachment says, man, my world's pretty trustworthy and so am I. I mean, I used to joke about 
that secure attachment was like Bigfoot, you know, everybody reports about it and stuff like that. But have you ever really seen one? But that actually isn't true. Generally, more than 50% of people will test as secure. It's always so confusing to talk about because the testing is so different, right? Self-report is one thing versus the unconscious limbic, you know, developmental attachment. But especially if you're not very blue, then generally you're probably more secure than you think you are. And that pans out so that if you tend to go red, you know that you get preoccupied. You know that you're in distress. You know that you have issues and you might even think it's worse than it is. And if you tend to lean green, you will probably be aware that you dysregulate and that you do dumb things and that you act like a jerk sometimes and stuff like that. Sometimes it's hard for us to see our greenness. (laughs) Right, right. Then if you tend to lean blue, you will likely overestimate your security (laughs) and your green zone. Those would be taken with a little bit of a grain of salt. Well, and that's been shown by research. That's not just Anne and Sueisms, that if you run in the blue, that you're more likely to idolize some of your childhood rearing and to overestimate your sense of security. And so that's why in this episode, we want all of you to kind of listen to what really constitutes a secure attachment, because it might surprise you. Because having a secure attachment base is not the same thing as feeling secure. It's not confidence. It's not thinking you know more than everybody else around you. So that's what it's not. What it is, it's the ability to maintain connections, deep, fulfilling connections. So somebody has a secure base, they rely on other people, and they feel confidence in themselves. So if somebody feels so confident in themselves that they can't rely on other people, that's likely means that their nervous system is actually not in this place of trust. So a secure connection, a secure attachment, trust other people, they trust themselves, and they feel comfortable having closeness. That's a real key. Yeah, that's a good one. You know, the word that comes to my mind with security is the word integration. And Dan Siegel talks about this from a neurological standpoint, but integration of thoughts and feelings integration of brain and body, integration of top of the brain and bottom of the brain, left of the brain, left hemisphere, right hemisphere, limbic, higher cortical. The idea being that there's a balance. Anne and I have talked a lot about the connection and protection systems, the connection system being the green stuff that we're talking about, the protection system being the other. We need both, but we need them to cooperate. (laughs) We don't want our protection system, you know, elbowing over our goodwill to protect us when we don't want it overreacting. Or once we do get safe after we're threatened, we want the green to come back online pretty quickly. So basically security means that there's a cooperation and integration between our protection system and our connection system. How's that? That was great. I loved it. (laughs) (laughs) Look, I I asked for feedback. Isn't that, isn't that secure? That's a sign of secure. (laughs) Actually. And you gave, and you gave a compliment. (laughs) That's also a sign of secure. (laughs) That's so true. Actually, that is literally a sign that you're kind of in your protective state. If you can't tell somebody you did a good job or, well, let's put it in a sign of security. I keep going to what's red and what's blue. I mean, I need to stop. I know, it's so easy to do. So let's say a sign of security, a sign of a, a secure attachment is that the connection to somebody else doesn't feel threatening. So that means being able to give them a sense of yourself, giving them a compliment, being able to join feels more natural. It's not threatening. Now, intellectually, it can sound like I like to join people. I go out and have beers with my friends, right? The question is, are you joining? Think about the idea of joining means like somebody's in there having a, telling a success that they have. What does it make you feel inside? It's natural sometimes to feel a little bit of jealousy, but when you're in a secure base of attachment, you can really feel joy for the other person and you can join them. You can say, that is amazing. You did such a great job. It doesn't hit a threat button where you're ready to tell your own story before they finish telling theirs. So a sign of integration is that you can hold yourself your own sense of self-worth while somebody else is experiencing theirs. It's not a competition. Oh, I think you said that so well. Thank you. Like, (laughs) I wasn't even joking. I actually really did mean that. I thought that came out really great. (laughs) What I would just add to that is kind of the other way too. So I think this idea of joining is really important because there is a way that you have to set yourself aside for a second So let's say you're telling me about COVID. Oh my God, I got COVID. And you begin to talk about it. And if I say, 
man, when I had COVID, da, 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 or I've never had COVID or, or, you know, John had COVID and he like, if I command the attention and pull it back to myself, that's not joining. But what would be joining would be you're saying you have COVID. And so then I stick with you and I might say, oh my God, how do you feel? How do you think you got it? What are you doing? What do you need? Like, in other words, things keep going back and keep going back. And I try to help and build out her narrative, but I do that freely. Like it's not hurting me. Or even if I can't wait to tell her how bad I had it, I'm able to hold that so that I've joined her and given her the experience of feeling heard and feeling cared for. That's perfect. Let's talk about that just for one second in terms of neural integration, because you just mentioned the word integration. What does that have to do with what you just said? And that is for me to sit and hold your story, I have to hold what is might be active in my body that if I don't have attention, I'm dropped, or if I don't, like there's all sorts of insecurity that could be coming up in me that I don't recognize, which makes me dominate and take over and tell my own story. An integration of this is you exist and I exist in the same light. So when you are talking, I actually, my body feels relaxed and able to join you because I'm not in protection. I'm not in fear. And so I want to help people feel that in their body as they're talking, as somebody's talking, do you feel activated? Do you feel distracted with your thoughts? Because if it's really hard to do that, it might be a sign that you're having a hard time staying in your more secure related place. Like the other side of that would be like you're, you know, we're talking about domination. The other would be that I'm going to ask questions and ask questions and ask questions and ask questions so that I don't have to talk about myself. And that when the, when the attention turns and every, every, all eyes are on me and I'm supposed to share something, mm-hmm. that that's very frightening because that I have learned to kind of get small and disappear and make other people big and make other people feel good. Again, we're not trying to say kind of how that that's, but the idea would be when the attention turned to me, going back to secure, is that, you know, it's not like I'm not going to feel awkward or that I might not get squirmy, but the idea is that the feeling is more manageable and then I can take the mic, so to speak, or I can take the time or I can take the attention or I can take my turn. That's actually another good one is turn taking, that there's a natural turn taking in conversation. And the turn taking is about being able to be sensitive and attuned, right? A big sign of secure attachment is the ability to be attuned to others, attuned to self and attuned to others. So when you're turn taking, you're able to be attuned to their needs and your body feels alive and alert for them. It's not just holding your breath because sometimes in turn taking, we're holding our breath. Okay. You take a turn. Just waiting for our turn. (laughs) Exactly. We're turn taking. But if you're holding your breath, waiting for your turn, it probably means that you're not sort of completely present. So a secure attachment, you're able to stay because your body feels more trust. You're living more in your connection system. That's what secure attachment's about. So if I'm in my connection system, then I'm actually interested. I'm not just turn-taking. I'm actually interested in what you're saying is lighting me up. It's making me think of things I've not thought about or I'm learning about you. And so the desire to know somebody, the desire to tune in without, like you said before, disappearing is a sign that we're in our secure attached self. Let's say you're going on and on or you're saying something really big and I notice that I begin to feel envy or say I notice disinterest. Like I'm like, oh my God, she's going on and on. (laughs) So I don't want to make secure like Pollyanna. Oh, good point. Keep going because that's so true. It's not Pollyanna. Because maybe you're Um, the secure attached one and I'm going on and on and on and you're you're really aware of that. And and I'm aware. And but but rather than either letting myself get flooded or interrupting and just cutting, you know, just stopping the situation. Basically, I have more bandwidth. I can think, God, Anne's really excited about this. (laughs) She's going on and on. What is going on? Like I can have that conversation in my mind. Because you also have curiosity. Which then, exactly. Which would help me amplify. Like if you're all excited about something, then I'm going to ask you even more questions. Like I'm going to help you show off this beautiful thing that you're talking about. I'm paying attention to what's going on with you that you're going on and on. But I'm also paying attention to me. Like by being curious about you, that is taking care of me to some degree. Or let's just say you're just being narcissistic and taking over the conversation. <laughs> and I notice I'm like, oh, she's really not tending to me at all. Again, we want to more talk about states. If I'm in a more secure state of mind, then I'll be more likely to be able to respond either by whatever I want to do. Do I have the energy to push in? Uh, Let's see. I'm going to 
insert myself and really begin talking about myself so it'll give her something to ask me about. Basically, I will have a range of ways to take up my fair share of the talking time and not expect her to, you know, not be waiting and keep going to the back of the line because she keeps talking. Well, that's allowing myself to be dominated. When I'm in a secure state, maybe I even get mad. Maybe I'm pissed. But that doesn't mean I'm not in a secure state. It means I'm noticing my feelings and then thinking about what to do about them and how to best respond rather than react. Oh, I love that. Well, you know, you keep bringing up secure state and we're talking about a secure attachment. I like that. Let's talk about how those relate because... We mentioned 50%, more than 50% out there likely have a secure attachment base and others don't, but that doesn't mean- Right, depending on the population, to, depending on the country, all the things. But right. yeah, there's a lot of securely attached people that will score, even on you know the AI and the ones that look at the unconscious. So if I have a secure base, that doesn't mean I'm always in a secure relating moment. I could like be having a really crappy day or a month, or I've been in a relationship for a period of time that my body's completely activated and more of a blue red, or maybe I don't live as much in the green, but I can be in a secure relating moment. So that's why we love to talk about the continuum, both state and attachment base. Because no matter where we live in our more embedded attachment strategy, we can always work to relate in a more secure way every day, every moment. And as we do, we do actually light up our more secure related attachment style. We can move it. We can become less red, less blue, and more green in our overall attachment strategies as we age, the more we engage in secure relating ways of being. And you don't even need therapy, you know, like really good relationships. There's lots of ways to move your map towards green, many, many ways. And another thing I was thinking was just going back for a minute and some of the conditions that promote security. That typically kids that end up with a secure map, or we might call it internal working model or a pattern of security in their nervous system and integration, typically have had parents that often are secure themselves or have done a lot of work to earn it themselves, or that they've just learned the skills because you can have a secure child, even if you're not secure. Isn't that great news? That is great news. Yeah. Yeah. But they typically will be responsive. First thing is they'll be protective. That's the very first thing. They'll be communicative. They'll be available. They'll be attuned. You're talking about the parenting. Um, that I'm talking promotes, about the parent. Right that promotes, right, attunement, which means accurate attunement. So instead of the child picks up a guitar and, you know, I take the guitar to show them how great of a guitar player I am, that's not attunement, even though you think, oh, look, I'm playing with my kid with the guitar. What's attunement is that the kid wanted to play the guitar. I remember when you were playing the violin with our niece, our niece's niece, no, our niece's child. What would that be, a second niece? <laughs> anyway, you were so good at meeting her where she was, even though you knew how to play and she would pick it up. Like I was like cringing that like she's picking up this nice instrument and she was young, you know what I mean? And like banging it around and stuff. And you were just letting her do it and letting her kind of struggle with it and letting her find the bow and letting her find the strings. That's attunement. What I was doing was not attunement. <laughs> <laughs> I was feeling more protective of the, of the violin. Um, not, I mean, not really. I was so happy that you were able to do that. Hopefully, if I had been alone, I would have been right there with you. But you already had that part down. But anyways, uh, soothed, protected, being attuned. The, uh, oh, the other really big part of promoting security is promoting the mind of the child separate from your own. So it's not just closeness. It's also when the child gets ready to be put down, you put them down. Even when the infant looks away, you don't force them to look at you. You you let them take a break in their eye with their eyes and their face. But the child is, you know, wanting a little alone time. If you're lonely, then you've got to just deal with your loneliness. I remember one time I looked over the crib at my sleeping child and I literally thought, he wants me to pick him up. <laughs> which is absurd, right? Because he's asleep. He's happy. Like, don't bother him. And so I was able to catch, no, I want to pick him up. This is my desire, not his desire. So that's an example of, you know, like, okay, if I had just picked him up and thought he needed to be picked up, you know, we could exaggerate that. I mean, we could 
extrapolate that into other ways that that manifests. But point being, it's like, whose need is it? And the attunement is actually accurate and that we're supporting the child's exploration and they're going away and their separateness as much as we're supporting their coming close and refueling with us. That's a good way to say it. And as much as we're supporting their ability and need to feel disappointment and pain. And I think another way, sometimes that attachment, the idea of attachment out there has almost made parents nervous to set a boundary, to set a limit. It's like, oh, I'm supposed to be perfectly attuned to this child and their need. That is not attachment. That is not security. The world is hard and we are helping them develop a protection and connection system in the real world as it exists, not in some ideal world that's perfectly attuned to them because the world will not be perfectly attuned to your child or to you. And if we think it's supposed to be that way, then we chronically feel a sense of being let down, a sense of being disappointed. So ironically, sometimes we can create more insecurity by having the child believe that they should never be disappointed or that I need to be preoccupied with all their needs and make sure that they never have a disappointing vacation because if they do, they experience a feeling of disappointment or loss So part of securely relating to that child is letting them have that disappointment, connecting with them and being able to go, that is rough. You really did want to do that. And we couldn't do that. That is hard. It is. But when we say attunement, we don't want to have the message be, you know, matching, mirroring. It's not merger. It is not merger. It's not merger. Which is also true. Now let's go back to secure relating attachment as an adult, that many of what we were just saying about parenting is also true about your primary relationship. Obviously there's some differences, but what are secure relating, secure attachment is in a primary relationship. It's that you can hold yourself and allow somebody to feel disappointment, but feel compassion and care for them and stay connected to that rather than I have to disappear to meet their needs or they have to disappear to meet my needs. So secure attachment is we both have needs and we can both deal with the with the competition of needs in a way that's loving and caring. You know, and I think the key to that is is mutuality. Like neither relationship and again this is a dyad it might be a sister or a friend or a, a polyamorous relationship it doesn't matter. The idea being that there is mutuality and even if you're, you mutually agree to different roles and things like that, that's fine. But still, the base is you have an equal voice, which means that we allow ourselves to influence our partner or our close person. And both, we also allow ourselves to be influenced. And probably most of us have, it's easier to do one than the other. <laughs> yeah, actually, for, that's a great way to put it. So let's just take a second out there and think about it. Like, take a moment before we keep going. How comfortable are you being influenced by somebody? And how comfortable are you influencing? Because that is a real sign of security. So those of you out there that like, I need to take a committee all the time. Like if I'm in the middle of always needing to take a committee, I'm having a hard time knowing that I can actually influence others and they can be let down. Right. So take a committee, you mean making a decision and declaring yourself without a focus group without a focus group. How does everybody else think of that? Right. (laughs) Exactly. And, and so the opposite is also true for those of you out there that we were trying to distinguish between feeling secure and being secure. This is a good one because if you are just feeling secure, then you think I don't need influence. I'm confident. I know what I mean. I know what I, I say what I mean and I mean what I say, and I don't need somebody else telling me what to do. I don't need somebody else telling me how to raise my child. I don't need somebody else fill in the blank. If that's what you're saying to yourself, I want you to realize that that is you in a protective, insecure state because a secure way of relating and a secure attachment, one says, I need influence. I need others. There are a lot of people smarter than me and there's a lot of people that I can help. And that is a secure way of connection. I love that. I think that's great. And and there's even research showing that the less influenced that you are, in other words, the more power that you have in a organization or in a family, anywhere, the more power you have, it causes changes in your brain similar to a traumatic brain injury. And the reason is 
that when we're not being given live feedback about how we're coming across. You mean like, so if you're in a position of power where people, you don't have to take influence, you get to give directions and you get to tell people That's what right. to do, but you don't really have to take any feedback unless of course you pay for it over there in a consultation. That's kind of what you're speaking of. I don't have to take influence. And it's a combination. It's not just that people stop giving influence, but it's also that the person in power, let's say if I'm the CEO, not only do I have fewer and fewer people give me live feedback that is different than maybe what I think, you know, that's more challenging to me, but that I need, that begins to reduce. But also my reading the room reduces. Your ability to read the room. Yeah. Well, the, um, there's actual changes in the mirror neuron systems. You know how like if I see someone cringe, I know the feeling of that because I can feel the internal cringe. The more power you have, the less that you fire when you see emotion in other people. You typically, you begin to reduce requesting feedback, you begin to reduce getting it, but then even just neurologically, you begin to miss signs around you that are being conveyed. And that that is actually really damaging. You you begin to lose function, basically. And you're much more prone to make bad decisions. It's not like the higher up you go, the better it is. It's actually, you're more and more and more vulnerable to, you know, we've talked about, we've talked about close relationships buffering us from stress. Well, the higher you go, and if you're not turning to people, just like you said earlier, if I don't think I need anyone, I, my body's going to be actually in more stress. I might bypass it, but you put a skin galvanizing response, or if you look at other physiological signs of stress, it's up there. So this notion of having influence and being influenced is really important. So it's kind of like, if you don't use it, you lose it. If you don't use yeah. it. And, and if you think about that, so you might feel, that might feel good, right? You don't ever have to take influence on some level. It can feel powerful and that can be. Yeah, you don't, you don't care what they think. Right. And that's the, the sense of us needing power instead of connection is a sign of insecurity. So when we are thriving on power at a cost of connection and empowerment, we are suffering and our relationships are suffering. So take that exact person whose sense of mirror neurons have turned down the ability to respond to the emotions of others and put them in a relationship with somebody or a parent to somebody. And you could see how that is going to really negatively impact those connections and how you relate. Yeah. And if you're not sure, then check in with your kids. Like if you know that you kind of are in a little bit of that more influential power position, there's two things. One is check in with people, like really actively see how your kids are feeling with you. And don't accept their first thing. Well, I'm fine. Everything's fine. It's good. Well, I don't know. You know what I mean? But really see if you can get them to open up and really let you know kind of what they need more of, what they need less of. Like really try to grease those wheels. So that's one thing. But the other thing would be, especially if you're just kind of in that kind of unfair advantage on top of a pile, like the king of the hill sort of thing. If you're way up there from in an entertainment or in your work, be sure and keep people around you that <laughs> will tell you how it really is. Like you need your jesters, if you will. You need the people who will be honest with you and tune into them. And you should really listen to them because what they have to say is very valuable. Even if you don't agree with them, they're speaking for a larger group, most likely. And if you have, but anyway, here we, we've but just drifted into talking about uh, <laughs> not secure relating. I agree. I heard that, but I was going to turn it. So if you're listening to this podcast and you're relating to that, you're reflecting and you're thinking, I really do need to ask some people about this. I really need to check myself. The chances are you're probably in a more secure relating way. If you're out there going, eh, forget it. Right? So if you're out there going, oh my God, I'm really curious about whether I do that. I'm really curious. I want to ask people, do you feel like you get to influence me? If you're willing to ask that question and you're willing to be curious about the answer and open to it, you're already in a more green position. Rather than the yes, no, I would say on a scale of one to 10, how influenceable am I or something, or how free do you feel to influence me so that it, you won't get the yes, no, right? And then the other thing is that if you're in a partnership with, in whatever way that partnership, you know, friend, whatever, if you're close with someone who yields more power, then hear this, they need the information you're holding. It does not help them for you to not say and to not give them live feedback about 
how they spoke to the waiter or whatever the thing is that you're not saying, like you're holding information that really belongs to the both of you that they need. So we want to really encourage you to take your fair share of the influence and to see if you can find your authentic voice, your right size voice, not on your tiptoes and not crunched down, but just your voice. Say it, say it proud. I mean, this is security, right? And allow them to have their feelings. Anne talked about disappointment earlier or offense or whatever it is. Allow them to have their feelings. It's not your responsibility, but you're going to stay connected to them. Oh, you know, it's a little hard to get that feedback. It was a little embarrassing for them to get caught doing that. And you're connected to yourself, which is, wow, that was hard to say. Good job that you got it out and you said it. Those are all really clear signs of being more in the green, a more secure way of relating, be able to hold that. I, I was thinking of another one, and that is being in a relationship. We, we keep talking about being connected to people and being able to receive influence and give influence. There's this idea of also feeling like I can be close with somebody and not lose my identity or lose my sense of self. And I think that's a real sign of secure relating. And that is I can feel close and I don't feel threatened that my sense of independence is going to be lost. I can be close and I don't give myself up. I don't fear engulfment and I don't fear loss of self. And so a secure relating individual says, oh, I can be close to you and I can really enjoy it, but I also have my independence. They, they both, it's an and. I love that. And, you know, I was just thinking we should think about it inside ourselves. And by secure and by the green, we're talking about ventral vagal. We're talking about our higher functioning mind. We're talking about oxytocin. And we've talked in other podcasts about being able to identify, are you in that state, our connection system or our protection system? So for me, again, I mean, and this is like everybody, like I will assume, I will think I'm in the green state more than I probably am. <laughs> but when we're actually activated, when we're actually activated, we often don't know that we're activated because we have these distortions that happen. So for me, it's like, there really is like a physical, I can feel uh, my heart, Sometimes I even imagine like a line that goes between my heart to the other person's heart. That's a really good sign for me. <laughs> and another one for me is pace that when I'm in a more secure state, like I'm back in my spinal cord, like I'm further back, like rather than like leaning forward and going, going, going. I mean, I can be in a secure state and active like that, but being able to take deep breaths and have a slower pace and have patience. <laughs> And have space for myself and my own thoughts and space for you and your thoughts and others. Those are all to me signs of like, I am doing pretty good here in the green. What about you? Yeah, because you don't have a sense of urgency. When we're in our protection system, we have a sense of pressure, a sense of urgency. And so when you recognize that you're not in a sense of urgency, you can tell. Yeah, because also like, let's say I'm urgently trying to get to the airport. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? That there really is something urgent. But it doesn't mean that I'm not in my secure place, actually, that like I can be in an urgent place, but also like, and if I miss the plane, it's not the end of the world, but I'm going to urgently get there. It's like a differentiated thing, but also like if I'm just urgent because I'm urgently trying to get something, whatever, walk across the house urgently, <laughs> then yeah, probably in my protective zone. That's a given. <laughs> but not know it. It's so weird. It's just going to be automatic. But that's how why we're, we're talking about how you know. The, the signs that you recognize you're in a secure place. One of the ways is, again, we bring up curiosity, it care. If you're feeling a lot of an experience inside you, but you really don't care what somebody else next to you is feeling, no matter what's going on for you, no matter how, then you're not. That's a good sign. Right <laughs> That's there. a good sign. So one of the ways we know we're in a secure place is that we have compassion for ourselves, but we can really care and be sensitive to the other. And it's kind of like you were, so what's your tell? My tell that I'm insecure. That I'm in a secure place. Yes, that you're in a secure zone, the green zone. I guess what we're talking about is what's a sign that was typically that we are in not our green zone and how do we know when we're not activating it? And I guess mine is like if I'm able to set a limit or a boundary and I know that somebody is going to feel some sense of loss or just, you know, some sense of or just be mad about yeah. it. Or, I, I, yeah. Not so much mad. For some reason, that one doesn't get me so much. But a sense of loss, a sense of like that, that that's disappointment or activation, right? I know that I'm in a really deep, secure space if I'm okay with that, that I'm holding what I need and what feels important to me 
in mind enough that, I, and I know that they can tolerate that and that they're going to be okay. Like, I don't have to be the one to take that away from them. I can trust them. I could be there for them, right? It's, like, it's not like, oh, well, tough on you. It's like, oh, I know that's hard and I'm still here. So it's that and. I think for me, the word and is really important. If it's you or me, then we're probably not in our secure place. If it's you and me, we're having a dilemma. It's you and me. How are we going to work this out? then we're able to show care and concern and self-compassion. And no matter whether, even if we're angry, right? Like I like when you were saying earlier, being in uh, a securely attached system doesn't mean you're never getting pissed and petty and all of that. It's that you have awareness of yourself. Or you will more quickly be able to catch it. Yes. And you're more quickly able to repair. Yes. Oh, that's a good one. We haven't mentioned that. Individuals that have more secure attachment base feel more comfortable doing repair and feel apologizing. apologizing. It's not hard to say. If it's really difficult for you to say, I'm sorry, to say thank you, those kind of things, it's likely a sign that you're having a hard time staying in a more secure place. For those that are live in a more secure attachment place, they can say, oh, I'm so sorry. I hurt you. Let me repair. And the reason that shows security, it's not just an intellectual decision, is your body feels safe doing that. And safe hearing the impact that you've had on the other person and safe being able to hear and, you know, how was that for you? What did, what did it mean to you when I, we had plans and I didn't come? You know, just whatever it is. What did it mean to you? What was your story? Oh, I could totally see that. That makes total sense to me. And it's not that you're self-flagellating. You're not losing yourself. You really are holding the other person's experience and sort of bearing it so that you can then, the apology is about what you actually did, not what's in your mind that you thought about. But I'm curious for you, the listener, that we want you to begin to really track your activation. And hopefully in listening to us, if you're if you're sitting or walking or driving, hopefully right now, maybe you're in a green zone. Maybe you are in an open, you're reflecting on what we're saying. You're curious about your own history. You're curious about close people. So that's what it feels like. If that's the case, take a picture, take a mental picture. Notice your jaw, notice your breath, your back, your arms. That's what it feels like. And the more that we can kind of memorize what it feels like when we're open, then we'll have some direction when we are a little bit activated of where we want to get back to. That's a really good one. Some of us may live there more than others. And for that, that means we encourage you when you're around individuals that are struggling with that to be a really secure lifeline, not a teacher, but an example to kind of help. And if for those of you that because of your particular circumstances, you don't get to live there as much as you want, our goal is to help you realize by keeping in touch with what it's like to be there, that you can continue to make decisions to recognize when you're not and to aim for it. And this transition and the growth in this direction is almost always going to be interpersonal. So look around you, look at your close relationships. Where can you deepen? Where can you reach out? Where do you need to set boundaries? Like Ann said, where do you need to tighten up? Where do you need to speak up that you haven't? Just make those little fine tune adjustments and you're going to grow that secure state. I love that. And if you, if you can't think of reaching out, like, I don't really need to reach out. I'm just going to do it. Tell your body like, oh, actually I do. They're, they're suggesting that I do need to reach out. It doesn't feel natural to me. It doesn't feel like a natural instinct, but just being aware that it's not a natural instinct moves you towards the green. We appreciate you sticking with us. And if you are still listening, hopefully that means you have found value. We encourage you to share this with anyone you think might be interested. Leave us a rating review. That's one of the best things you can do for us because it helps discoverability and helps other people find it. And then also visiting our sponsors. If you'll look at who sponsored this show, they're the ones making it free and available for all. And by taking care of them, you're taking care of us. Absolutely. All right. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you around the bin.